I know. Wait, are, we're, we're about ready. Uh, pro, are you good with uh, what, you, what you're working on? What? No, Jim, I just, I want this intro to be really special. I was kind of doing a George Carlin seven words you can't say on television kind of thing, but I don't want to get demonetized for demonetized. curses in the first 60 seconds of the video. And, I, you know, it's just frustrating. I just, That's a lot of pressure. A George Carlin bit? We're just talking about curses in Dungeons and Dragons. You know, like when you cross a hag or, you know, like, uh, yeah, steal uh, some gold. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. That's... <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Ink and Liar. They're a family of creators working on Patreon to release new printable items, spells, and monsters for your home game on a near daily basis. They just released a fill in the blanks devil's contract for DMs to print out and have their players sign, as well as a fiendish encounter supplement with hand drawn maps, perfect for your new descent into Avernus adventures. At their highest tier, you'll receive a uniquely designed t shirt just like these. So check them out, you won't regret it. Link here and in the description. So, Jim, let's talk about curses. Ooh. Whether they be item, whether they be uh, agreement, yeah. yes. whether they be object. Anything. I mean, any. I mean, curses, it's just one of those things, like, whether it's a tomb, whether it's a book, whether it's gold, you know, curses should just be everywhere, right? But you would think, right? They, they seem to be, like, all in the inspirational literature that D&D &D grew out of and has mm -hmm. influenced and vice versa, and, like, curses are part of fairy tales and, and wicked magic and almost the archetypal, uh, you know, dark magic. Of, of oh yeah, using, ask Strahd about that. Mm -hmm, right, like, yeah, just like using using your magic to impose something terrible and long lasting mm -hmm. on a, uh, you know, on a person or their descendants mm -hmm. or, or any number of things. It's just iconic. And and to me, it's like, if you think about this and you're using this to like, fuel your your campaign prep or or you know something that you want to do with your character or something and then you turn to like say the mechanical options for curses and you might find yourself a bit underwhelmed i i know that i often do uh <laughs> to, to the extent that i don't really use the spell bestow curse that often because it's like that's a souped up hex it can do some things but when i think of curses i think of that l very small paragraph in bestow curse that's not necessarily helpful because it doesn't have any guidelines but it's, you can think up uh, another thing that sort of fits, you know, another curse that fits these four parameters, which are like, you know, disadvantage on checks or disadvantage on certain saves or taking extra damage. Then you can with your DM, DM's help. And it's like, can I get a inspirational list? You know, like I can think of some weird curses you might want to pull mm -hmm. on somebody. And so I just, it's, it's a type of magic that I think number one is, is very, um, amorphous and ill-defined curse what is that you know there's a lot of spells in the player's handbook that that are not labeled curses you might think of as a curse it's also sort of antithetical to the way that a lot of magic works in fifth edition which is like short-term temporary has to be like focused on by the caster to keep it in effect whereas when i think of a curse it's something that's like oh no this you you fell into a very particular trap yeah, you know, they someone didn't just cast a spell on you. They did a working. They did an undertaking, and you you fell for it. And now you have gotten yourself enmeshed in this magic, this spell that consequently you can't just remove with another third level slot and not having to do anything about. It. And I think, mm -hmm. like at the heart of it, it's the fact that bestow curse and remove curse are is a, a light switch that you flip on and off, and it doesn't really do anything interesting. It's just kind of there. Yeah. And I, I want something more like a, a full-fledged, you know, triple-A stadium lighting situation. I want strobe lights, fog, you know, I want people to have to go to the hospital afterwards when they see it or, yeah, yeah. or question their belief in God or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, like that's what I want after they deal with a curse. Definitely have some pyrotechnics <laughs> in there. Um, anyway, right. a, lot, a lot of things too close to an open flame, yeah, whatever I, it is. Yeah, I mean, I'd be hyperbolic all day long. I want it to drive the campaign. I want right. it to be something that's not just a combat debuff that's thrown on by generic warlock number four. I want it to be like, no, this is the curse of campaign villain. It does these specific things. Like mm -hmm. these are the specific ways that you have to get rid of it. Like that is an adventure. You know, that's a that's a, an experience. You're going to remember something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know? But so when it comes to that, yeah. You know, you want something more than the light switch. 
and you want it to be part of the the campaign and drive adventure and everything but yeah. like how how deep and how far and how far reaching should it be is there can you go too far with it I mean, I, I certainly think so, right? Like, you can think of something like, say, the Death Curse from, from Tomb of Annihilation. And when you, like, start thinking about that, and you start thinking about the implications that it has for the whole world, mm -hmm. and the fact that it affects people not just who've died and, and been, uh, you know, resurrected, but, like, new souls as well. Yeah, yeah. And, like, you, you really start thinking about that, and it's like, that, wow, that, that's kind of a big deal, for the world, and, and, and I know that there's some concessions made because you have to find a way for the players to be the heroes of that story, but again, I don't usually, that's not my preferred method of, of running games, but you can take it too far. I think if like the implications of the curse are so great that it alters the tone and theme of your game, you've taken it too far, right? Or if the implications of a curse like mean feel like the players can never overcome it or that they've had the deck stacked against them so much that they can't do anything about it oh yeah and those are situations where like you maybe have taken it a little bit extreme i think in a game you should be able to reverse a curse certainly to an yes. extent yeah yeah uh unless it's like one of those like it's a very subtle thing it yeah. only affects like you know maybe like when you're dealing with money or something oh, like sure, something sure. kind of like Kellum Vor, but you don't turn into a wear panther. In GURPS, this would be you know they you design a flaw that had like you know the frequency of how long often it's going to come up. Yeah. You know, and you can probably do the same thing with like curses. Like, is this an every session thing? Is this an every encounter thing? Is this a once every few sessions thing? Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a lot of different ways that you can interpret it. And, like you're saying, like it, it comes up maybe in specific circumstances and in specific instances, and you can learn to live with it. You know, it could even just be like something like you're always driven to wanna wanna pay for the stuff when you go into town. Yeah, but you're always trying to negotiate a good deal, and you'll even maybe like try to slip some <laughs> slip some fake gold or whatever. Yeah, even yeah. when it's just something just simple, something you're just simple. buying some rations for a few copper. Yeah, but still you're like trying to stiff them to copper, and it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't help yourself. Those sort of subtle curses and generational curses, uh, in the case of Kelimvor, are something that I don't think currently with 5th edition rules it's e that easy to uh, to represent. You're going to have to homebrew something. Yeah. And similarly, I, I feel like you really would want to homebrew something that prevents the removal of it from being a spend in action, spend the slot, now it's gone. I mean, that, that's my problem with lycanthropy and, and werewolves and all other kinds of uh, lycanthropes is that they're interesting monsters. I, I love this idea of, of the, the animal side taking over and producing this physical change in a person. There's a lot of really cool uh, wear creatures out there to use and like a third level spell takes care of all of it. And in our Lycanthrope episode we kind of touched on this uh, as well in ways you might not necessarily have that uh, happen, but think of them more as like a special form of magic. Uh, Forgotten Realms has the Mythals, uh, other, other worlds have, uh, you know, epic magic or, or archmage level magic or something. And curses could maybe be at the opposite end of that spectrum, a, a kind of magic that's open to everyone. Mm -hmm. A form of magic that's very specific, uh, unique to the individual or, or very, uh, you know, highly personal. And that might mean that every curse has its own you know, condition for removal and that uh, even they remove, you know, the way I might handle it is like, yeah, you still have to do these things. That allows you the opportunity to cast the spell, right? Like the spell has a variety of conditions on it in which it must be cast. And one of those is that you have fulfilled the condition of the curse you are trying to use remove curse on. Mm -hmm. And it's only at then that you can imbue those actions with magic in order to get rid of the curse that that that's even possible. Like, yeah. I think that's kind of how I would do it, sort of a, a compromise, but maybe you have to go to a specific location. Maybe there are creatures in the world that you have to placate who can uh, either remove the curse for you, take the curse and give it to someone or something else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's always the best way uh, <clears throat> to have a stipulation in the remove. Like, you don't get rid of it, you gotta pass it on. You gotta pass it like, on, yeah, uh, you gotta trick it, someone like, else to uh, take it. It follows, it's probably. Yes. That, that's like the perfect movie. Yes. That kind of thing. Absolutely, right? Like, it, it's got this element to it where it's a living thing. The curse mm -hmm. is alive. You can't just dodge it. You mm -hmm. can't just get out of the way. Uh, and something like, say, Razzle Sin, uh, you know, as I looked, at, looked back on that campaign after we played it, one of the first things that I would do if I were to run it again is, like, Razzle Sin has a hand in the use of magic in this part of the world. You don't just get to come in here, cast your magic willy-nilly beyond a certain level. Like, 
she knows. You've done it. She knows. And not only that, but she siphoned off a portion of it for herself. And in, in the context of how I would use it a second time around, those, those, that store of energy that every time the players cast a spell, mm -hmm. they're giving their villain a resource, uh, that's a part of the curse. In, in the context of that game, you could go visit certain people and they could protect you, or you could visit certain places and while there you would be protected from that effect. You could attempt to resist it yourself by maybe, I, I, I think at the time, I'd say maybe like you can spend an inspiration and that gives you the opportunity to save. You know, like that's how old her magic is. You agreed to the terms of this agreement by just walking here. And it allows her to do all kinds of metagame stuff that I otherwise, you know, wouldn't be able to do. Use layer actions outside of her layer. Have certain spells have different effects whenever she uses them. And it was kind of like an intersection between a lot of custom rules that I otherwise would have not provided justification for, but instead in this case went like, oh wait, like the curse of Razzle Sin is that she has this power over this region, it made, kind of like a demigod for this place. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an extreme situation, and in that sense, I would definitely tell the players out of, out of game ahead of time, like, hey, there's a metagame mechanic going on, and like, when you cast certain spells or spells of a certain level, you're gonna give me points. You're gonna be, <laughs> whatever it is, curse points, whatever we'll call them, you know, and they're gonna let me do all kinds of weird and, and nasty things to you. That way, you are giving the player the choice to dig their own hole. Uh, it is the same with, with a cursed shovel. With a cursed shovel. Well, speaking of, of cursed items, is like I, I like to do cursed <laughs> items that way as well. Thank you. Right. That's in, right. that, in that, like, just a, a minus one to something, or like, you know, when you hit an opponent, you deal half damage to yourself as well. I find so many cursed items just, they're either gotchas. In which case it's like, mm -hmm. all right, like now that I've got a bag of devouring and don't have any of my stuff, like, oops, like, you know, like what was the point of that other than the dungeon master getting a bit of a kick out of like fooling a player, mm -hmm. which is trivially easy. Because <laughs> they're all idiots. <laughs> uh, I like a bag of devouring because it's like you get it, it happens to you if you're not paying attention. Yeah. And then it becomes that item that you try to use and try yes. to dupe other try to make it do NPCs other yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, with it. Certainly. It's just that like, you, so you can't identify cursed items through the identify spell. You will really only identify a cursed item when you try to use it and it reveals the, the cursed nature of it. Mm -hmm. And or like a backbiting weapon. A backbiting weapon. Some there are some really neat ones in the Lost Laboratory of Qualish adventure. Like the Gambler's Blade, is one I think is really cool. Where you pick one through three. That's its bonus, but then that's also a corresponding penalty you get for um, death saves. I think. And then there's another one. I forget, like the Medusa Sword or something, where it's like if you fumble, you run the risk of uh, of, of petrifying yourself. Cursed artifacts or items that have enough of a benefit that the player who has it is going to consider this as an asset, mm -hmm. but enough of a drawback that they will be inconvenienced sometimes. You know, I, I don't want something that like completely makes the character unplayable, but I might have something like, you know, for example, you, you pick up the sword uh, or you use the item or the ring or something and you know, you maybe can feel that there's something going on at first. Maybe, you know, it's the power of it. Make an Arcana check just to see what your character notices. And then it's only over time as they use it, as they uh, come to rely on the item that you reveal, no, this thing has like developed a parasitic relationship with you. And once you're in too deep is yeah. when you realize that you've, that you've fallen for a trap. Not this, you know, oh, as soon as you pick it up, no, now you can't put it down kind of situation. Even though you did Basically, did that to me with the ring. I mean, I did, right? Like that. That was that was a uh, that was a that was a while ago, though, right? So. It was a while ago, yeah. But um, I don't think I'll be forgetting that anytime. I don't soon. think so either. I don't but think, yeah, I will yeah. say the reason I won't forget <laughs> it is because we did talk about it once it happened. And yes. I remember you saying, like, if you don't want to do this, we don't have to do this. Yeah. But I was like, no, it'll be fun. Yeah. And it was one of the most fun campaigns. I and mean, it was a very small one. It was just two players yeah. and you as the DM. But. Like going through and getting, trying to get this ring and get uh, Soraka or whatever his name <laughs> was uh, out of, off me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a deal with the devil. Like literally, yeah. where it's like, yeah, I'm going to need to use your abilities that you give me, but the more I do, the more yeah. hold you have over me yes. yeah. for when I try to deny you. Uh -huh. And so, like, playing that, that 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 game of give and take and 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 knowing how in 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 debt with the house you are so to speak yeah 
uh, it's kind of an important part of these curses if you're, if that's the way you're going to go with it. Yeah, and, and that one like changed your character, and you know, I I, yeah. I was thinking more like uh, cosmetic changes, but you can even have cursed items where it's like, yeah, you're changing personalities, mm -hmm. ideals, beliefs. You might be getting different. Change abilities. my alignment. Change your alignment. Mm -hmm. Change all kinds of different things about uh, your character because they like it, that. That's how powerful the the magic is. Possession, uh, as you're talking about, is another interesting one that can be a part of cursed items you know yeah. whether it's like a a spirit of an intelligent weapon or or a ghost of a former user or something and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a a curse in that control is taken away from your character but it could be a case of like well there's someone else living with you in your mind or there's a there's a presence there that's not your own that produces in mm -hmm. literally intrusive thoughts yeah like, like the uh, sort short sort of sharpness is what i'm thinking of from the driss novels oh sure yeah. where it wants to be with the strongest person <laughs> yeah and kind of changes category over time because it wants to be with drist things like that like yeah is it subtly altering your behavior and these are things that like you're gonna have to break down that wall between dm and player and and, and collaborate more because the dungeon master is going to be like, hey, here's my intent for how this curse should work or, or how other people, say, in the world deal with it. You know, you're free to deal with it as you see fit or, or any other kind of creative way, but mm -hmm. you do expect it to be accounted for. And I, I don't think it's unreasonable for a DM to say, like, yeah, you've been cursed or, as we've talked about in, in other episodes, like, you've got a form of madness or you're overtaken momentarily by fear. Like, it's okay for the DM to say, these are changes you need to make in how you portray your character but that needs to be accompanied by here's how you can reverse them. Even if you keep the specifics secret and you don't like, you know, you make the player kind of work for it a bit because, you know, you just don't give the information away like that. You can at least tell them, I anticipate this is going to take three to four adventures or maybe longer if, you know, it's just handled as a side quest or something. Yeah. Or if it's something you really want to get rid of, then let's schedule a couple of one-on-one -on -one or small group uh, sessions specifically to deal with it. And like it's an opportunity for the character to like grow and change and, and do something interesting and a chance for the dungeon master and player to do something different that they might not have before and you just gotta sort of trust that <laughs> that the dungeon master is not out to completely screw you over um and is trying to do something to make for a more interesting game yeah because yeah. let's face it you knew the place was cursed that you were going into so it's the place that's trying to screw you over absolutely I mean, yeah absolutely how many, how many times in, in in movies tv books or whatever you know you go into a place oh this is you know go to the old mummy yeah. joke this is cursed this is that cursed, is cursed yes. yeah. the cursed gold the cursed whatever uh, our, our literature and our, our stories are, are rife with these things these places that you're yep. not supposed to meddle yeah. because of the the detriment i mean there's there's something good there that you want. You don't mess with it because it's a sacred, uh, you know, burial site or something. And, yeah. and there's a lot of, of different myths and legends and, and cultural values surrounding the dead and what you are and are not supposed to do with them. It, this is really one of those things where it's like, is there a belief in our own world and our own history somewhere that someone thought this stuff was magical or supernatural? Then why is some variation of it not in a D&D world where this supernatural stuff is real yeah. you know maybe burying someone with their grave goods is how you prevent them from coming back as a ghoul you know mm -hmm. and if you take them then you're you're both cursed in sort of a sense that you're marked by a monster and that monster's coming for you and yeah what are you gonna do you stole it you know? or, or <laughs> i mean like if you steal someone's stuff that's how they become a ghoul Certainly, you know, yeah, yeah. That, now just, they're after the, you the cursed gold from say pirates of the caribbean or the cursed mummy's treasure it, it's just you don't mess with it. And because it runs counter to what a lot of players expect they should be able to do, it creates for moments of tension. Oh, this is a big pile of treasure. Well, yeah, this, there's also a really clear sign right here that if you take it, you know, it's, 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 all, it's on you what happens next. Yeah, and, and you see a bunch of skeletons that look like they were trying to take treasure out of this room, but right. they all look like they died horribly <laughs> while carrying said treasure. Right. But I'm going to go try to take it I'm anyway. I'm try to take it anyway. So that's sort of one, the desecration of tombs or, or burial grounds, uh, but just like a generic death curse is another that you might mm -hmm. encounter this. Like, it's uh, an idea from Dresden, which we like to draw from just because there's oh, yeah. a lot of good ideas there, but... That idea that you're with the last of your magic, you utter a curse 
upon the being or entity that killed you. So the fictional world of Dresden, it keeps things more copacetic between wizards and those who like them because there's always that last retaliation. A, a beast might know that it can kill a wizard, but it still has to live through its death curse, which, yeah. you know, they may not have much magic, but having it all unloaded at once, I don't know what's, you yeah, know, that, yeah. can, that can strip your, your, your resistances, your, your immunities away. Oh, yeah. And then you're just, that's you for the rest of your life. Yeah, you know? it kind of sucks, yeah. yeah. Or if it's like a duel between two wizards that, you know, that it, mm -hmm. it, it might be kept non, non lethal because yeah. of that fact. So having that kind of thing there is a way to enforce certain types of behavior. So you can say, like, yeah, anybody that breaks this taboo suffers this curse. And because you're dealing with, a, with game worlds where magic, world spanning magic, magic that affects everyone or whatever, is common or at least plausible, um, you, can, you can set things up in your world so that the mechanical elements that you're using to like reinforce a certain uh, you know, genre or theme or tone maybe also have magical elements in the setting that reinforce those things. Yeah. So it's a kind of a dual purpose. What does a monkey's paw look like in D&D? If it's an item where you have to use it, mm -hmm. where you've got this thing and it manifests your desires in sort of the worst way possible or, yeah. or interprets them in one of the worst ways possible, then I can almost see it working like it's an off-brand wing or ring of wishes. Right. <laughs> I can almost see it working like uh, subconsciously. Like you don't even, you know, maybe that's part of the curse of it is it. Maybe it's not sinister. Maybe it's just overly pleasing. Like, I'll do whatever you want, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a spell. I, you know, I'm a magic item. I'm, I'm, I'm only here to fulfill a certain purpose. And, oh, what is that? Oh, and then the magic just goes off for you can even fully form it. And that's why you get those weird inconsistencies. And, yeah. It's like, just it, the too much of a good thing. Too much yeah. of a good thing. I mean, that kind of raises a point of like magic, uh, magic curses, magic items that are cursed things. It doesn't have to be like malevolent. It could just be really inconvenient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just like, I just don't want this. <laughs> oh, yeah. How do uh, I get rid of it? <laughs> yeah. Definitely, uh, especially if you're talking about like a sentient item, a good uh, inspiration to draw from is uh, Altered Carbon. Yeah, the yeah. The uh, Poe, the proprietor of the Raven uh, uh -huh. Hotel, which yeah. is an AI, and AI in this world <laughs> are like clingy, crazy ex like exes. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, That yeah. just, they want to do everything, and they end up in your room all the time, uh -huh. and they're like in your thoughts, and it's like, okay, you need to back you're off. Intense, but it, uh, But it's, yeah, it's never like overly malevolent. It's just no. very annoying and inconvenient. Yeah, and, and so, like, so, yeah, so you know, maybe the curse is actually like in uh, some sort of like extra planar entity or something that's with the character, and creates effects and, and the like for them that they think are being helpful, but it, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Or the curse is actually like a magic disease uh, or something like that. It doesn't respond to normal medicine. It doesn't respond to regular type restorative magics. There's something else going on. And it represents both a, like say, spiritual condition as well as a physical ailment. There's a, there's a ton of medieval myths that link like spiritual health with mental health and yeah. and like the you know if the king is diseased of mind then the country will be diseased in its its body politic kind of thing. And so you can make those connections there like that where it's like oh you're cur you know like uh, you you broken our social taboos. You're cursed. So how do you, how yeah. do you see this uh, this these mechanics uh, playing out? Disadvantage is nice. It, it, disadvantage advantage is, is probably one of the better parts of fifth edition, but it being the only mm -hmm. significant source of, of, of uh, penalties or boosts is it really limits things. And yeah. I, I get why, you know, I, I understand that. And I think that like disadvantage on ability checks or disadvantage on certain saves is a good place to start. But I, I really do think that where curses shine mechanically are where they encourage or or sort of like reset the boundaries for what is acceptable behavior from the players mm -hmm. and vice versa from from the NPCs and and so anything that affects why you would take certain actions the kind of actions that you do take or would like affect the way people react to you those are all great avenues for curses so an example of that might be you are cursed with whatever comes out of your mouth the other person hears it the worst way possible you know, that's your curse. And mm -hmm. that might be expressed as a disadvantage on all charisma-based checks. Yeah, yeah. But that also doesn't seem enough to yeah. me. And so it might mm -hmm. just be that you not just have disadvantage, but like the difficulties that, like the difficulty class that you have when dealing with anyone is going to be different. Yeah. You know, maybe the base difficulty for any social challenge for that person with a curse is 20. And it just goes up from there. And if you're not optimized for, you know, social interaction, 
a mechanical sense, then everyone who listens to you just hears a raging, screaming asshole who makes yeah. everything personal. Whereas you're just over there like, why won't anybody, I'm not, you know, listen to me. Why is everybody treating me like this? You know, maybe it's, it's cursed with your hair falling out or your fingernails falling out or you're cursed with scabrous growths or yeah. there's a lot of things that have no mechanical impact on the game other than how the DM should treat the character from their NPCs, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Cursed cursed with seeing, you know, uh, undead or ghosts everywhere, but they're not really real. But they're you not know, really real. Fake, yeah. fake booze. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oh, yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe it's auditory, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you have experienced auditory hallucinations because of a curse. From a mechanical perspective, it's disadvantage on certain perception checks, or you might even just flat out say, like, occasionally tell that player, like, hey, you think you hear an, a monster or an enemy or, or something. And, um, yeah. you know, and maybe sometimes the whole table gets it, maybe they don't. Like, you, you keep them guessing by inconsistency with a hidden consistency. Like that, mm -hmm. it might sound like it might sound like stupid and like Jim, what the hell are you talking about? You want to hide the pattern, basically. You want there to be a pattern that can be discovered, because that is an enjoyable part of of these games, and and they might get a kick out of it. But you don't want it to be so obvious that you might as well have just handed them a remove curse spell and said, get you know, yeah. this is minor inconvenience. Do you have any mechanical stuff for what how you treat curses or just detrimental magic effects and things like that? Gesh spell? Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. because I mean that is a curse. Yeah, yeah, in, it in is a, kind of, yeah. In a regard, you have to do way, this yeah. thing and if you don't, you are cursed, basically, yeah. right? So looking at that like where when you violate the tenets of the curse, if that's what it is, like yeah, you know, if you do if you do this certain thing and you're not supposed to. Yeah. Um you know, for temporary, maybe your, uh, maybe one of your stats is is halved or reduced, oh, yeah. certainly, or something like that. But it's only within the bound temporary, like it's temporary, right, 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 right. You know, yeah. I mean, like your constitution is reduced for a bit, or yeah. you're, you're weak for a little bit, or clumsy. Yeah. Or, yeah. I'm all for messing with player stats. I know players don't like that, yeah. and that's it's a thing that is has fallen by the wayside as additions have gone on, taking experience away, negative levels, things like oh, this, things like that, yeah. ability score damage. Yeah. But to me, like. That's a deterrent, and that is, is yeah. that. Is, other than hit points, it's a way to make players think about their full character yeah. and care about their full character. Yes. And screw your dump stat, like. <laughs> yeah. If that's how you, you know. I mean, everybody's got one, I guess, but you know, or they don't have to. They don't have to, yes, certainly. Um, yeah, you can, and you can, and with those kinds of things, you can sort of like target other areas of weakness of the character, and and, you know, if it is say a particularly strong fighter or something, maybe they are cursed with weakness or cursed with clumsiness, mm -hmm. or cursed with like never being able to remember any of their <laughs> their martial training or something. And so they've got to temporarily find other ways to kind of uh, oh. get around their problems. If they ever make the killing blow, they won't remember the fight. Yeah, yeah, something you could just Think like, about yeah. that curse for a fight. Yeah, you're just like, well, I didn't do that. <laughs> and then they never remember. I really though like that idea of like sort of an everyday style curse. One, you know, one of the things that, that struck me as, you know, whenever I was studying Roman history was they, they find these uh, spells and prayers were just written on like usually like sheets of tin uh, or, or something that's like durable and it, you just to me it kind of like surprised me and was a humanizing moment in, in studying ancient history where it's just like here's a bunch of people who are just like mad at their neighbors and <laughs> you know like just they've got regular people problems they've, they've been driven insane by the people in their lives mm -hmm. and and are obsessed with stuff or or, or someone hurt them and they they felt the need to like write out a prayer of cursing, you know, to you know ask Apollo or Hera or whoever to to strike down their enemies, and like that leads me to believe that things like curse words in a D and D world are not just social taboos; that they are things that have a magical effect, and you don't just throw a curse word around lightly. You know, oh, yeah. it's a big deal. Just playing in a world where. The, the, the magic weave is so, it's almost tangible. You can almost taste the sure. magic in the air. Sure, and but it, yeah. it's just a readily available folk magic that doesn't require spell use. You know, it doesn't yeah. require the incantation of things. It's uh -huh. just like, what do you do? You Are you really mad? Then make an oath to the Furies. Are you in grief o over mm -hmm. something? Then call upon this thing. You don't need any magic other than the power of your experience as a yeah. person. Yeah, the release of your, your anger, your whatever emotion that you're feeling. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, when you say, damn your strength, damn yeah. your, your back, or you know, yeah, whatever, whatever it is. is. 
And, yeah. a, and a peasant just says that to an adventurer, and then you go off adventuring, and all of a sudden, you know, yeah, every you, time you crit, there's no extra damage. There's no extra damage, yeah. You like something that, like uh, that, because you, yeah, you pissed that person off back in town. Should warn them against the evil eye. God, come on, man. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing, right? Like, that is why you have these, you know, myths and legends in our own world of, of why, they say, the evil eye is so common in, in certain parts of the world, and, mm -hmm. and why you see it invoked as, as sort of a token against dark magic is it's like yeah we're gonna ward <laughs> we're trying to ward this off of it it ties into that everyday folk magic in a, in a world that is not necessarily the kind of magic that pcs are going to come across like and use personally but they might see it being used in the world and that's mm -hmm. going to tell them something about the people here are the people here known for just uttering hexes and curses and they just have a, a low grade you know kind of a power like that or, or tapping mm -hmm. into it. Does that suggest something about uh, the place that they live, the history of the, the location or anything? It might, it could. You could tie that into your adventure. It's another way to link them all together and have mm -hmm. something really cool. I, I've come across this mechanic um, a couple of places and not always in the, the, uh, the context of a curse, but um, it's usually, uh, usually you roll a die to sort of refresh a resource, right? So sometimes you might see this as, uh, you know, you have a torch, uh, roll this die every, you know, time interval to see if it goes out. Uh, in alien, that alien RPG we played, it yeah, was like the oxygen, the oxygen mm -hmm. tank uh, would be like that. And so this one instead goes, you've got uh, a cursed item, some kind of weapon, let's say, and it carries with it both a benefit and a drawback. And there are different levels of it, right? And each level is assigned a die size. So if you're familiar with also say like Numenera's uh, artifact depletion, kind of works similar to that. So let's say we start out with a cursed sword that you know your fighter liberated from a, a white's tomb uh, or something. And when you first use it, you know, holding it for an extended period of time, or maybe just sort of notice it after a fight, that your hand's kind of numb whenever you, yeah, you know. But it cuts like you know nothing, and and it you know it also like it's really hot out, and you feel kind of nice and cool while you're uh, while you've got it, but. When after a fight, or after a critical, or after a day, whatever interval your DM decides, you roll a d10. Let's say you roll a one on that d10. You've now entered the next step of it, and your die goes from d10 to d8. And now your right arm is covered in a frosty layer. Right? You know, just like when after wielding the sword, you've just you've got ice flakes and mm -hmm. frost on your hand. It maybe starts to get uncomfortably cold at night around you and it's like as this goes on and on and on you slowly become say like an ice ghoul and you know wield this blade that that is infused with the spirit of this white or you can seek a way uh, to curb your influence over the weapon or the weapon's influence over you try to break that cycle but the idea yeah. is that it's in the player's hand how often they use this they're told you that when you use it this is the condition under which you roll this what's called a cataclysm die and as you get further and further down, like when you get to a D4 and you roll a one, you're done. This thing has taken you over. You know, you're a, an ice ghoul now and you're a puppet of the frozen Lich King or whatever, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's like that. You can use that mechanic for a lot of different things. It doesn't have to just be curses and the like. You can use it for events that are happening in your world or, or other kinds of like doom countdowns. But I've seen it in the context of magic items and it's a way to like, help reinforce the sort of cost benefit you know this 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 magic item has a price while putting more agency in the player's hands and also like gradually introducing the doom you know they can stop at the d6 level <laughs> like holy shit, you're like shit i'm you know I, I don't want this anymore but i've enjoyed the benefit up until now up until now as opposed to some other cursed items which are like all or nothing yeah. you pick it up you use it once you're done. Yeah, you're it's, cursed. Yeah, That's you're it. cursed. Mm -hmm. This is more of a gradual, and each step, the condition to get rid of the item becomes harder and more difficult yeah, until it's you, impossible. You basically get to contemplate cutting your own arm off. Maybe it's a ring. Maybe it's a crown that has, uh, you know, cursed spirit in it, a la the Ice King. Or maybe it's anything. Maybe you went to the wrong place. You mm -hmm. know, you, you stumbled in the wrong patch of forest, or you pissed off the wrong spirit. Uh, there's a lot of ways you could use that uh, mechanic for your uh, for your games. Yeah, I like the idea of a cursed mind, uh, ring of mind shielding, since it has that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the if you die, it, it traps their their uh -huh. mind in there. So what if what if they were casting a curse when they died? When they died, and they yeah. carried the curse into the ring with them. Uh huh. Or they want to like 
switch their mind with yours kind of thing. They're already on the inside there. They don't, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like that. any kind of like a wizard's consciousness is trying to come back. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Though. Wizards are a curse in and of themselves. Oh, God, but that's that's they? a that's a show for another day. They really are. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons. The Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our interview with Dale Kingsmill of Monarchs Factory YouTube channel. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. <laughs> That's fucking sweet. Not straight up <laughs> from we back in the day. Rolling. You kick your ass, dude. <laughs> <laughs> My cousin <laughs> that had Mickey Mouse's uh, laugh, yes. but nobody would ever tell him that because he'd kick the shit out of you. Um,